<laughs> I'm making a joke. Please stand up. Number 1024. Number 1024. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, freedom ring. Verse 4. Our fathers, God, to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God our King. Please remain standing for the first prayer, Father in heaven. We do pray that you would protect us by thy might. We do pray to you, great God, our King, the one who establishes and puts down nations and tyrants and good rulers and bad rulers. We come to you this day in anticipation of our 247th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence thanking you for the many years of liberty that you've given us. And also, Lord, pledging to humble ourselves before you so that that liberty might continue. We need your help at this hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. You know what I did before I came, in, came to church today? I got my cell phone out and I turned it off. So why don't y'all do the same? It's really good to see everybody here this morning. God has been good to us, has he not? And I look forward to worshiping with you in this next hour. Welcome. Good morning. It really is a beautiful day. We are truly a blessed country. Song 768, please. 768. Jesus. Yeah. 
reading and our lesson this morning, song number 112.
song after the lesser will be song number 940, 940. If you would, turn to Judges chapter 7, verse 7. And there we will be reminded of Gideon. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand and let all the others go, every man to his house. Good morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, open our eyes that we may see, open our ears that we may hear, open our hearts that we may obey, be fruitful, and multiply. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your joy. Teach us to be cheerful givers of our time, of our treasure, of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, Jerry, I'm really glad you led that song, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. It, it took me down uh, memory lane. There was a time in my life when I had preached more sermons in Spanish than I had in English, and that particular song is called Maravillosa Gracia in Spanish. I learned that song in Spanish before I learned it in English, and it was just, it brought back a lot of good memories. I, um, I don't remember all of the words in Spanish, but the part that I love the most this may sound kind of silly to you, but you get to the middle of the, the chorus and the, the basses are going, flowing like a fountain. In Spanish, it's como clara fuente, siempre suficiente. Da, da, da. It's, just, it's just fun. I, um, I know that's a strange story to tell, but uh, thank you for leading that song. I love it. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, Jesus is alive and well and working in the world today. Amen. Amen. And is he alive and well and working in the nations today? Yes. And is our nation one of them? He is at work. I'm going to be talking about something, a familiar story from the book of Judges. And before I get into it, I think I need to kind of lay a little groundwork. When I read these stories about the battles in the Old Testament, when God was establishing the Israelites in their nation, and there was death destruction, and bloodshed, and God uh, caused a lot of bad things to happen to people that were sinning against him. And it's kind of harsh looking. There is a connection, however, to the New Testament. Jesus Christ is called the Prince of Peace, and his kingdom is not of this world. And the battle that we're engaged in is not the same kind of battle that took place when the conquest of Canaan took place, for example, or when the Babylonians rolled in and destroyed so many of God's own people who had abandoned him. And we see some pretty gruesome things happening. Now, I'm not going to tell you that there are gruesome things that happen in this world. There are, aren't there? There are people starving today. There are people dying today. There is bloodshed today, even in our nation. That's not our battle. So when we read these stories about these battles, I think it's important to, uh, for us to understand that with the coming of the gospel, it's not that we've been removed from the battlefield, but our weapons are different, and our battle is different. So the encouragement we can get when we read the story of Gideon is not so much that we're going to destroy all these people that have got bad, bad things you know, out for us and that they, they don't like God's people and they're trying to put us down. No, the real power is when Satan gets trampled over by enemies of God becoming friends of God. Amen? That's our warfare. That's our battle. And that's why we need to be courageous and fearless and actually joyful and ha happy when we have an opportunity to interact with someone who is trapped in Satan's web. Long time ago, Israel, after coming to God, 
did as they so often did and left his worship and left his care and started disobeying him. And as so often happened in those days, they found themselves unprotected. God gave them over to the Midianites. Just like in Romans 1 where it says God gave them over to this and God gave them over to that. God gave them over to destruction by the Midianites. The Midianite oppression was severe and the Israelites had to hunker down in mountain clefts, in caves, in strongholds. The Israelites would plant and the Midianites would plunder. They'd just take whatever they planted. Along with the Amalekites and others, they would ruin all of their crops all throughout Israel. They spared nothing for Israel. As it said, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came like swarms of locusts in numbers impossible to count. They couldn't count the numbers of the people and they couldn't count the numbers of the camels even. They invaded the land to ravage it, as the word says. Finally, things got so bad that the Israelites did what they should have been doing all along. They cried out to God for deliverance. The Lord's reply was not to the liking of the Israelites. In fact, let's read his reply. In verse 7 it says, And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. That doesn't sound very promising, does it? Sounds, in fact, like the pleas of the Israelites had fallen on deaf ears. Have you as a parent ever said to a child, I told you and I told you and I told you and I told you and I've told you a thousand times, now let's go to the woodshed. That's what it sounds like. But God is merciful. And the next thing we see happening is the angel of the Lord coming to a man named Gideon. He's threshing wheat in a wine press, hoping to escape the watchful eye of the Midianites so that, so that what he's threshing will not be taken by them. The angel of the Lord calls to Gideon, and he says, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now picture this for a minute. This guy's sneaking around hoping to preserve some of his food and hoping that the Midianites just don't see him and the angel of the Lord looks at him and says, mighty man of valor. I don't think Gideon felt like a mighty man of valor. In fact, his response, if you read it, doesn't indicate that he feels like a mighty man of valor. In fact, he doesn't feel like God is looking out for him. And he more likely felt isolated from God and inadequate for the task of leadership. And like so many people that God has called before, he didn't initially want to take on the task. He didn't trust that God would protect his children. In fact, he, but, but, but he eventually did come to believe. You know the story about the fleece and all the other things that God did to kind of build him up and give him confidence. And once he believed, he was ready to lead. And we all know, and the passage was just read to you, about how God used Gideon to cull the herd. He was able to raise up a mighty army, several thousand, 30,000. And then he, and then God said, that's too many. And he culled it down to 10,000. And then he culled it down finally to 300 men. And how with those 300, the Midianites were put to plight and destroyed. You know the story. You've heard the story. Even today... That story of Gideon's 300 connects with me emotionally. Whenever I'm feeling discouraged, I'm think, I think, well, you know, it's been worse. But there's another place in the story I'd like us to focus on in the, in the, last, in the, in the time we have left. And whenever when anybody says in the time we have left, you start thinking, well, it's only about five minutes. It's more than five minutes, all right? <laughs> But there's another piece of the story I'd like us to focus on in the time we have left, and it's where I got the title for today's sermon, Every Man's Sword. Most of us know the story, and if you don't, if you don't know the story, Judges chapter 6 and 7 is where you can find it, and I would encourage you to read it. 
But as I said, God told Gideon to, to send all the soldiers home but 300, and he did. 300 took on that multitude that was like locusts, too many to count. They put their 300 around the camp in three companies. The 300 men, they divided them into three, into three companies, okay? And they were given pitchers and torches and, the, and, and um, a trumpet. A trumpet, a torch, and a pitcher. Yeah, I think they had their weapons too. But the, the unusual weapons they had was a trumpet, a torch, and a pitcher. And at the right time, what were they supposed to do? Break the pitchers? Revealing the torches, lighting up the area, and shouting the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. That was the battle plan. Didn't go to West Point. That was the battle plan. They did as their captain Gideon commanded. They broke the pitchers and they shouted, and then God began to work his mighty work of deliverance that you already know happened but let's read from Judges 7.22 and listen to what it says. When the 300 blew their trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp, and the army fled to Beth Acacia toward Zerira as far as the border of Abel Mahola by Tabith. So let's recap this. The people cried out to God. The people sinned against God. God brought them under judgment. They cried out to God. God, initially resistant to their pleas, raises up a leader. The leader, initially weak, grows strong. He obeys the Lord, and he, and he shrinks the army as God commands. And when the time came for battle, God turned every man's sword not against Israel, but against themselves. That's awesome. Behold the power of our God. Feeling discouraged? Feeling like the enemies have got us surrounded? Take solace and take courage in what God did on this day to his enemies. That's what our God can do. But what does that mean today? I know, because I've talked with some of you. Some of us are anxious, concerned. Sometimes I'm anxious. Sometimes I'm concerned. We've lived through 300, 246 years of independence. I believe tomorrow will mark 247, if I did the math right. What does this story of Gideon say to us as we go through these times of anxiety and as we go through our current national crisis? And indeed, the world is going through kind of a crisis at this time. What does this story say to us? I believe there's several lessons we can learn, and you might have already learned them. Chief among them being that it is God who raises up and puts down nations and kings, and he does so in the context of their walking with or walking against him. This nation, our nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the notion that all men are created equal, was also conceived, if you will, certainly accepted by, as John Adams described it, a moral and religious people. Did you know that? Our Constitution was designed for a moral and religious people that is wholly inadequate to the governing of any other. Roughly quoting what John Adams said. A moral and religious people who believed in the God of the Bible and believed we should honor and obey him. Perfect men and women? Obviously not. Has there ever been a perfect man and woman? Look at the first century church. There was a whole lot of imperfection there in those people that have been redeemed by God. So let's get, a, let's get away from this notion of perfection. But they believed in God, they wanted to honor God, and they were doing their best to do so. Many, many people in, that, in, the, in the nation were. I believe even the least religious among our founding fathers would be appalled at the level that our moral life has fallen to in this nation. 
Makes me sad. Makes God sad. What must our God who establishes the nations think? I don't think he's pleased. Lord, help us. Lord, forgive us. But see, that's not where the story ended in Gideon. There was this judgment. There was this trouble. There was this loss of sovereignty that they, that they, that they endured. But that's not where the story ended, is it? See, he delivered through Gideon's leadership when they cried out to him. He had mercy on his people. He caused the Midianites again to destroy themselves, turning every man's sword against his companion when his people cried out to him and when his people started obeying him once again. And you know what? It's not only Israel that God delivered if you look in the Old Testament, wicked Nineveh, the persecutor of the Israelites, who destroyed so much of Israel, so they were so bad that Jonah the, Jonah the prophet didn't even want to go to preach to them because he was afraid God would forgive them. And guess what he did? He preached to them, and God did forgive them, much to Jonah's consternation. It is true that the moral state of our nation is not good. I'm not even going to argue about that. I mean, because honestly, to give you all of the examples of it would probably do more harm than good. We're in a mess right now, morally, as a country. But Scripture contains examples of God forgiving when His people turn to Him and of God protecting people He had formerly punished when they came back home to where they belong. So it's not over. And we don't have any reason to be pessimistic even. So our America, our homeland can be redeemed. We can become once again that Christian nation. Not my words. Those are the words used in 1892 by our Supreme Court to describe what we were, in a general sense, a Christian nation. If you want to look it up, it's the case is called the Church of the Holy Trinity versus United States. That's what the Supreme Court said about that, about us. We can become that Christian nation again if we humble ourselves, if we pray, if we repent of our sins. Things can be much, much better. Consider what the Bible says about the matter. Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You've heard that hundreds of times. What is the, what is the prescription? Jesus gives it in the Beatitudes. Hun Blessed are those who, what? Hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Is that something we can do? Can we as a congregation decide we're going to pursue righteousness? Do we need an act of Congress to enact that? We can do that, can we not? Psalm thirty-three, twelve: Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. So come back to God. Can we do that? Starting here in Manchester, can we return to the God that perhaps we've offended? Can we repent? We can do that, can't we? And then finally, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen: If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now see on that last one, beloved, we need to understand something. If my people who are called by my name, are we his people? Are we? Okay, if my people who are called by my name. There's another thing we need to understand. This was a, a, a statement spoken to, God, spoken to Solomon by God at the dedication of the temple. And he talked about if they would come back to, to them in this place, referring to the temple. Where's the temple today? Within us. If my people who are called by my name will come to him in this place. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. So are we his people? Are we called by his name? Are we praying and seeking his face? Are we, have we turned from our wicked ways? Have we humbled ourselves? See, it's not about the president. It's not about the Congress. It's not about the Senate. It's not about the Supreme Court. It's not about Fox News. It's not about CNN. It's not, it, it's not about your favorite boogeyman, whoever it is. This is about us. Are we God's people? He's speaking to his people, people that are called by his name. And we are called to humble ourselves, to pray and to repent. And what's the promise if we do? He will heal our land. Beloved, this is the most patriotic action that you can take. This is the best thing you can do for the United States of America is to humble yourself before the Almighty who raises up and puts down nations and kingdoms and empires and tyrants and despots and good rulers and bad rulers to pray and to repent. The God who knows how to put his enemies into confusion and the God who knows how to turn the swords of the enemies against each other will hear, will forgive, will heal. And my hope is that he would drive every one of those enemies to their knees in penitence before the Almighty while they are still breathing. Because I don't desire, God doesn't desire that any perish, and neither do I. But I do desire that his name be lifted up in this country because that's our one best, only hope for progress and survival. And that's really been the one best, only hope for progress and survival since our nation's founding. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, we pray that you would humble us, that you would show us your ways, that you would show us where we've fallen short, we know so many ways we've fallen short. Some of us have been cowards in the face of this uh, ugliness. Some of us have participated in it. Some of us have promoted it. We pray, dear God, that you would forgive us for walking in bad paths and that you would restore us to fellowship with you. Because we know, Lord, that righteousness, a right relationship with you, exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We thank you, Father, for the glorious history that you've given us in this country. I pray that you would restore to our memory the fact that it is you who gave us our glorious history. We need your help at this, at this hour. We really need your help at every hour. When we think things are going well, we, we need you. And when we think things are going poorly, we need you. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of being your children. And we pray that, that you would make the changes in us that are necessary so we can bless the land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's not over for anybody. He died so that we might live. He came to this world in a time when the idea of human rights had not even been established. Despots ruled, due process, what's that? It was raw power and our Lord conquered. We can be a part of that. So if you find that you've been maybe wandering and getting too caught up in the wrong things, now is a time, this now is a good time to put down a marker and say, you know what, no more, I'm walking with God. And if you've never begun your walk with God, now is a great time to put that marker down, to be immersed into Christ, to see your sins be washed away, to see yourself be filled with His Holy Spirit and to be added to His church. And then let's go about the business of blessing the land. 
Come to Jesus while we stand and sing. Hear the sweet voice of Jesus say, Come unto me, I am the way. Hark in the loving call of faith. Come for me, loves you so. Only a step, only a step. Come for me. By the way, it was one year yesterday. Um, one of the things I love about being here with you is I've been part of other churches where when people were struggling, they wanted to just hold it to themselves and not, not share that burden. But there are many in this congregation that are 
willing and wanting to share the burden. And Candy came up here just a moment ago. The best way I can describe it is Satan is attacking and the family needs protection. So will you pray for her and the family every day for Candy and Randy and all the kids and all the grandkids? Because if, if Satan can destroy families, that's we're just one step away from chaos. So this is important not just for the Chase's family happiness, but also for an orderly society. So we're going to pray for Candy and Randy now, and, uh, and y'all are going to pray for them continually. Amen? Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, we lift up Candy and Randy and the kids and the grandkids, and we pray, Lord, against Satan's attack. We pray that you would protect them and their children and their grandchildren and their friends and everybody who comes into their circle. This is important, Lord. You know that. We don't have to tell you. We pray for better things. We pray for strength to resist the devil's attacks. And we pray for peace among every member of that family, not only with you, but with the entire family. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you with these matters and know that you hear us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Song number 769. May I call you Father, may I call you friend, I heard you Jesus, I heard you with my sin. Yeah. 
Before we go ahead and celebrate our independence tomorrow, I figure today is a great time to celebrate our dependence, which we don't always like to do, but I think is very important. And we do that with the Lord's Supper each and every week, even if we don't always think about that. And one thing I know is that not everybody in the world celebrates July 4th, but all Christians all over the world partake in this each and every week. And if you'd like to open up to the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 9, it'll be starting in verse number 16, where it says, For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet, wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant, which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and according to the law almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. And what we see here is that in order for this new testament, this new covenant to be put into place, Someone had to die. And what's really interesting about that is you have to have someone who's perfect, which we are not, and that only leaves God. And then you ask, well, how do you kill a spirit? That's a hard thing to do, to kill a spirit. So God has the idea to send Jesus in the form of a man, in the body of a man, to die on our behalf, which is absolutely amazing. And we are dependent on that body because there would be no New Testament, there would be no new covenant if it were not for that body that died. If he was not sacrificed, we would still be lost in sin. So for that very reason, we remember his body because it was sacrificed for us and because we're lost without it. We are dependent on that body in order to have a shot at eternal life. Let us pray as we remember the body. Our Father and our God, we love you so much, and we thank you for this time where we get to be together, to remember the body of Christ, and remember that he had to die, 
that there was no other way, that there was no other body, that there is no other route to salvation. And we thank you for the life that Jesus lived. We thank you for the words that he told us, the things that he taught us, that no man can come to the Father except through him and through his body. And as we remember that body, we just thank you for the ability to read about his life and to understand that without it, without that body, we would be lost. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we partake in the cup as well, we're reminded once again that there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. And the blood of bulls and goats that were sacrificed for so many thousands of years were not enough to fully cleanse the people. So in order to receive the cleansing, we are absolutely dependent on the blood of Jesus. And as we partake in the Lord's Supper each and every week, what we are ultimately signaling is that we are submissive to God, that he is above us, that he has power over us, and that we must be obedient to him in order to gain the blessings that he's talked about. No other savior will do. No other root will do. We cannot declare our independence from God because we are here because he willed it to be so. We cannot run from him. There is no place we can hide from him. And as it says in Colossians, all things consist in him and Jesus is upholding everything. So we're thankful for the blood because we've chosen to submit and take this blood as our own. To have it cleanse us and cover us, and continually forgive us of sins, as it says in 1 John chapter 1. Let's remember these things as we pray for the cup. Let us pray. Our dear Father in heaven, um, we come before you this morning, bowing our heads, humble, thankful, that you loved us so very much that you gave us your only son. Father, what we see before us, what we hear, what we touch, everything, is temporary. What is eternal is our souls and your word. Father, the word had to become flesh 
because our souls are lost in need of a savior. And that savior, your son, had to go to the cross and to die for each and every one of our sins so we can be saved and live home eternally with you. So this morning, we remember what Jesus did for us on that cross. And we look forward to our home in heaven with you. Father, I ask that you bless all of us here to partake in this cup that represents that blood that cleanses us, that makes us holy, that allow us someday to come before you. It's in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. And that concludes the Lord's Supper for us, but we do take this time as well to take up the collection for the congregation. And just as we are dependent on God for making sure that we have salvation and forgiveness and all the wonderful blessings that come with it, God also instituted a family in the church to help us depend on each other, to take care of each other. That includes, of course, monetary support for the congregation and the body as a whole. So our members here, we we do give to collect and to make sure that we have the ability to support each other. If you're visiting with us, you're not under any obligation to give because we are a family who works to take care of each other. And we're just glad that you're here with us to experience this family. And we definitely hope that you'll come back. But I will say that it's not just the money. It is the prayers for those who are hurting. It is the time that we spend visiting. It is the encouragement that we can give one another. All of these things are ways that we depend on each other. Because if there's one thing we've learned in this country, throwing money at stuff doesn't always solve the problem. So we have to have hearts to be there for each other. And this collection is just one way of doing that. So I'll pray. Mighty Heavenly Father, we are truly blessed to be able to take up this offering right now. You give us so much that we have 
excess. That we can share and give up to you. Father, I ask that you'll be with those who have their hands on the money to disperse it amongst those that are in need. Father, I ask that you'll be with each of us now as we give. Help us to do so cheerfully, happy hearts. For you have done so much for us and it's just amazing that we have need for nothing but have so much. Please bless this money as we Give it now. It's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we are truly blessed to be here this day to remember what you have done for Israel and what you have done for us through Jesus. We come before you, Father, in humbleness and how you could take a broken people as we were, all were at one point or other and lift us up through the shed blood of Christ. Pray, Father, we'll never forget that. When we see the things that are going on in our communities, in our world, we need to humble ourselves to the point where we pray all the time. We need to seek your face Seek your ways in all things, in your word, those around us. Seek out one another when we need help. Again, we need to continue to pray. We also need to repent. There are things that affect us. Times we want to Take things in our own hands. We know those aren't the godly ways. I pray, Father, that we have repentant hearts. Remember that we live in your kingdom and that your kingdom is of utmost importance and others need to know that too. We ask for wisdom and the knowledge of your word to reach out to those who are hurting around us. And teach them about your son. Teach them about your ways. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the words of encouragement this day. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Few announcements this morning. Uh, prayer requests. Please remember to keep uh, Kendi, uh, John's wife. Uh, she's still 
they're still in the process of figuring out uh, the paperwork. And it's even twice as difficult because you got two governments involved, not just one. I continue to pray for Frida as she recovers from her broken ankles. But uh, from what I've seen, nothing's slowing her down. Uh, thank you for the prayers on behalf of my brother. He came through the surgery very well. He was able to get around and he's doing very well. So I appreciate that. Please continue to pray for Paul. He's that black belt I was telling you about that I trained with. Uh, the update is, is they've discovered he has a foreign object in his, in his head. How it got there, who knows? But uh, he's going up to Lebanon in, on the 5th uh, to have that uh, looked at and possibly removed. Also, please continue to pray for Marco and Juliet Torres. Uh, Torres. Uh, they're going through a trying time. Marco is trying to find a new job. And uh, that necessitates a lot of, that brings a lot of anxiety. Also, Linda Paul requests that you uh, hold her up in prayer. She's having her second cataract surgery on Wednesday. And uh, Mark Dumas has been diagnosed with COVID, so please pray for him. And on a lighter note, uh, several of, of you came to Barry and I and said, nice job, good job in selecting Danny to come and work with us. Actually, the credit belongs to God. I mean, we looked at a lot of resumes. Uh, we brought up two people and Danny foolishly accepted the job <laughs> we're very glad that you're up here it's hard to believe it's been a year uh hopefully god grants you much many 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 more years in the service in here in manchester let's go for the record the last one was 47 years <laughs> let's go 48 <laughs> uh. <laughs> so we we uh we have been blessed. Fred. Oh, oh. oh, okay. It's still here, but uh still requires our prayers. So we are dismissed. Uh we will have uh, we'll begin a Bible class maybe five or ten minutes past the hour. Because uh we talk too much up here.